ministries today. We're about to start our service. So if you're getting settled and you're focusing, I ask you to bring a focus now to our Lord. Uh, the late service would have a prelude. The early service would have a gathering song, and Wes would come and then speak and pray. So let us start our worship service. Our Father in heaven, God, we look to you. And we believe you are seated upon your throne, which is a great white throne. We believe you are mighty and powerful. We believe you are kind and compassionate. We believe you are fair and just. And we believe you are completely wise and you see all things. You see us worshiping you right now. So we come to you in your son Jesus before your throne. And we come to ask that you would make us one through your Holy Spirit. And I can sense it, God, thank you. Though we are not present in the assembly, we are present in spirit and present in heaven. Holy Spirit, thank you. You connect us wherever we are. And now, Father, we ask you to help us bring a, a service of worship that is pleasing to you grateful to you, honoring of you, bringing glory to you, for you are worthy. Lord Jesus, you are in command of heaven and earth. You have all power and authority, and we feel comfortable and we feel secure being under your wing and in your fold. So may that peace that you give come to us now, the peace that you gave to your disciples at your resurrection. Would you give it to us now during this trial and trouble? Your peace. Would you even touch those who may be watching who don't, have not accepted you yet, but would you give them a grace to introduce them to you? Your peace and your security are amazing. Holy Spirit, lead us in this time. Bless Karen now as she leads us in songs, and bless each one and each family in their homes or in their cars as we sing songs you have taught us, as we sing about a love that lifts us out of the angry waves. Holy Spirit, begin to lift us now. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. Karen. I hope that the love of God lifts you today as we sing this beautiful hymn, Love Lifted Me. So sing along wherever you are. I was seeking deep in sin, far on the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of See, heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me now save am I love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me Love. 
lot of things are changing and different now, but one thing that will remain the same forever is the love of Jesus. He loves us. His love never fails and never gives up on us. Sing this with me. One thing remains. always there to lead us in the waters that may sound deep and scary. He's always there. He said he would never leave us or forsake us. Sing this song with me. We all know this. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours you are mine
Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. So I on your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine pray together, church. A little different this week. The comments are enabled on the Facebook Live, and I know it is live, and we don't have a lot of confidentiality that way, but if you want to post a prayer request, Michael is watching, and he will let me know. If you want to text me, I'm looking right at my phone right now. We have some concerns on our prayer list church you received the prayer list last night in the email let's pray together God may our feet go deeper may our faith grow stronger may our roots go down and the living water come up Jesus that is the Holy Spirit that you talked about the woman at the well was drawing for water, but you told her there was a living water that if she drank of that water, she would never thirst again. And she was very interested and she received you. And she told the whole village and they received you. And people have been sharing you throughout the world 
and we have received you. And if anyone is watching and wants you, the invitation is there for them to receive you as Savior. And let's share here, sharing our hope, sharing our goods, sharing our funds, sharing our food, sharing. That really is what Jesus came to teach us and really is what every, every self in us has to get over. Are we greedy or are we giving? Are we hoarding or are we helping? Oh, it hits us right in the face. Jesus said we can't serve two masters, money or God. Whew. He hits us there. And Ben, I hope you're watching because I want to have you as a guest pretty soon to speak about tithing and giving. Let's pray. Father, we lift to you the offerings given this week and even now. And we ask you to use them for the upbuilding of your kingdom, for your church, for your ministry to glorify your name in the name of your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, our message is next. And, and you know, during the song Oceans, I don't know if Kelly Jackson is watching, but Kelly, you know, I could see you singing that song. I hope you were singing it. You know, and Jennifer and Summer are just clapping and smiling that you are singing Oceans. You had your debut, and no doubt Kylie and Cameron and, and Kennedy are all helping you there in the living room. And even Caden, he is a good singer. You have a family of singers, Kelly. Um, you know, if you want to swing by the church and sing a verse of that, Karen will fit you in at the end of this telecast. We'd, we'd like to feature some new talent here at Trinity. And I do that in fun and in love because uh, Kelly loves that song, but she's resisted our invitations to, to sing it. Uh, we'll see what God does. As I open the message, um, we talk about sowing good seed. Did anybody mow your grass this week or have someone mow it for you? If my eyes look funny, it's because, yes, I mowed grass. And, yes, I'm allergic to grass. Um, our granddaughter Lexi handed me two dandelions this week. Look, Granddaddy, pretty flowers, and I received them. Michael, in first grade, I picked dandelions, I sniffed them in class, and my eyes swelled shut. <laughs> I had to go home, and all of a sudden they found I had allergies. So there's good seeds, and there's good allergy medicine too. We appreciate that. But I'm going to read from Matthew 13, not the whole thing. Many of you know this story. But may it speak to you afresh. May the Holy Spirit bring out of this account what he has for us today. If you want to stand, that's what we do when we read the gospel of Jesus Christ. Out of respect for him, we stand. So please do. If you're not able to stand, don't. But let's stand. Matthew 13, verses 1 to 9. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the sea. Great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and he sat. And while the whole multitude stood on the shore, he spoke many things to them in parables. Parables are stories that need interpretation. He said, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony or hard places where they did not have much earth, thin places, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched or withered, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and then the thorns also sprang up and choked them out. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Clint, we'll probably have to shut the computer sound off, or even Michael, go ahead and mute the computer. 
As we dig into this, Jesus, the sower of good seed. Can you think of some small seeds if you planted your garden? Some small seeds? Um, Mustard seed? Karen's dad was a tobacco farmer. Tobacco seed is small, very small. Um, Big seeds, peach seeds, potatoes, when you cut them up, they're a big seed. Here's a question. And, Michael, you've got this, this scene in your screen, so if we're good to go. The first question, Jesus worked and worked to plant one seed, one kind of seed. And, and Michael will bring that up in just a moment. It's under the sermon, sermon script. Worked and worked to plant and to cultivate what seed? What seed do you think he really worked to plant in our hearts, to plant in the disciples? Well, let's study the parable and find out. Let's, many of you have had, like I say, you know it, you've heard it. Let's, uh, let's hear Jesus' interpretation and let's just dig right in. The first seed that was scattered, it said he went by the wayside. It, it fell on the path. It fell on the road. If we went out in the parking lot and scattered seed, it 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 wouldn't live. There's no soil. It would die. The birds would get it. It's the hardened ground. Hardened ground. And Jesus says the hardened ground is like a stony heart or a hardened heart that doesn't receive the gospel, doesn't receive the word of God. Martin Luther, Martin Luther the Reformer back in the 1500s, He was a German priest used by God to bring us back to the heart of the gospel. And Martin Luther has a commentary. Even back then, they wrote commentaries. And this is what Martin Luther says. Therefore, Christ says, the devil cometh and taketh away the word from their heart, that they may not believe and be saved. What power of Satan this alone reveals that hearts hardened through a worldly mind and life lose the word and let it go so that they never understand or confess it. They lose the word of God. They lose the offer of salvation. They lose repent and believe, repent and receive the Holy Spirit, repent and have everlasting life in heaven. It, it, they hear it. It may register in the mind for a while, but Jesus was very clear. Satan comes and takes it away. How? By distraction, by conflict, by confrontation. There's all kinds of ways. And, and Luther says, quote, 2 Timothy 4, 7, they'll turn away their ears from the truth. They'll turn aside to fables. People will turn aside. Jesus said in Matthew 5 about the salt that loses its flavor. He said it is cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Trodden on the wayside, stepped on on the path. It's useless. The the, the seed is not picked up. The seed does not sprout. It's taken away. And church, let let me share with you, the world to me just got smaller this morning. You know, Dr. Anthony Fossey, a director of our, our epi- epidemiology and, and director of our, our health institutes for our country. We see him on TV all the time. I, I wanted to look up if he was a religious man or not. I, 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 he is a wonderful personality, a wonderful intelligence. And so I was curious if he's a follower of Jesus. Well, in my discovery, reading about him online, I found out that that we're alumni. He attended the College of the Holy Cross, probably the class of 62. He's 20 years older than me. But we were probably in the same science building doing our inorganic labs, our organic labs in Haberlin, which is down the hill. And, And I know that building was at least 20 years old when I was in it. So Dr. Fossey went to a Jesuit school. He was raised Roman Catholic in Brooklyn, New York. 
He's complimentary of the scholarly commitment at Holy Cross. And, and I agree, it was, it's a very good school, good education. And I kept reading. And in Dr. Fossey's own words, he said he isn't as much a Roman Catholic anymore as he now he is a spiritual man, or he calls himself, and he now believes in the good of mankind, in the good of humanity, which I do too. But he didn't say he believed in the goodness of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know Dr. Fossey. I haven't met him. Yeah, he's, he's an Italian, got Italian relatives in Italy like I do. But I don't know if he held to what the priest taught us at Holy Cross. I, I didn't see it. Has the word drifted from him? Has his heart become hardened or stony because there's so much intelligence and academic excellence? Sometimes our own minds can be a barrier to our own hearts. Now, I would welcome a conversation with Dr. Fossey about this. I would welcome it, man to man, alumni to alumni. Um, I'm a former Catholic, maybe he is too. But I still believe every core doctrine of the Catholic Church, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ was fully man and fully, fully divine and fully human. He was the sacrifice at Calvary. His blood paid for our sins, and he was bodily resurrected on the third day, and he's coming back for us. Christians, that's what we believe, Catholic Church included. So this first step came to life for me, this hardened ground. And I'm, I'm by and large, not preaching to the hardened ground. But if there's one person and your heart is hard, please listen to this Psalm 95, verses 8 and 9. Michael, I'm not sure what you've got because it took a lot of time to get all this ready. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As in the day, meaning the day of rebellion in Meribah, as in the day when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. What's God saying? God's saying, they saw me deliver them out of Egypt. They saw me part the Red Sea. They saw me. And yet they tested me and didn't believe that I would come through for them, and they hardened their heart. Ha, huh, church, that's the message Jesus has for us today, not to harden our heart to the Word of God. We have seen His work. If I, if I asked for online testimonies or, or Facebook post testimonies, please don't do it right now, you all could share testimony after testimony of seeing God work in your life. Here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. Receive and hold on to the Word. Receive and hold on to the Word. That's the beginning. Hold on to it. Second part of this parable Jesus tells us, He says there is rocky ground. Now, Karen and I understand rocky ground. Let me tell you, where we live, we have a lot of rocks. You have to bring in soil to grow anything. So, we understand things that don't grow. And this, Jesus said, this is the same as a shallow heart. Shallow heart. Not enough soil to really grow. Things spring up, but when the heat comes, like last August and September, when it's 90 and 95 degrees every day in a row, everything dies. It all died. That's what happens. One of the words that jumped out to me in this passage is that when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered. In any way, do you feel a bit withered, weakened, drained, even scorched? I do. This thing is not easy. This virus is after us. It doesn't play fair, so we come at it with everything we know and as God leads us. But it's draining to stay home day after day after day, not do the things we normally do, not come back from Sunday church, just so glad to be with the Lord and His people. No, 
There's not much social soil. There's not much church worship soil. There's not even much restful soil. I'm not sleeping real good. Are you sleeping good? That's okay. God knows that. And here is the lesson. I've got, I've really got some good verses on what Jesus is trying to teach us, but I don't have time to go through them. Maybe later. I got 10 steps, 10 verses that take us through what G- Jesus is really trying to teach us. Michael, you've not got them. Let me just br- summarize them this way. How many times did Jesus say to his disciples, O oh, ye of little faith? When did he say that? He said that in Matthew 6 when the disciples were worried about food and drink and clothes. He said, oh, you have little faith. Seek the kingdom. My Father will provide those. When he talked to Andrew about the, and, and Philip about the bread, and they were all worried about not having enough bread, he says, oh, you have little faith, Matthew 16, 8. Why are you talking about bread? Matthew 14, of course, with Peter, when he caught him on the, on the water, you have little faith. When they're in the boat and the storm, different occasion, Jesus is in the boat. He says, why were you feel fearful? You have little faith. Then he begins to teach them a little faith like a mustard seed. You can move a mountain. You can say to a tree, move. And now the wind is really blowing here. Hallelujah. James teaches us, James is Jesus' younger brother. Do you have a younger brother? His younger brother, James says, let him ask in faith without doubting. No doubting. To the Gentile woman who begged Jesus to heal her daughter, he says, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. She hounded him. And and he finally said, woman, okay. Great is your faith. Your daughter is healed. The Roman centurion, Jesus said, I have not found such great faith in the power of God, not even in Israel. Your servant's healed. And James, his brother, said again, the testing of your faith. Be assured the testing of your faith and the amplified. Norma, are you watching this, Norma? Do you have your amplified Bible open or on your phone? The amplified Bible adds these two key words, by the testing of your faith through experience. And that's what James means. James is a deeds, a works guy. Let's do it. The testing of your faith through experience, it produces endurance. And I add patience, perseverance, stamina, conditioning. How many athletes condition themselves by workouts? We are in the middle of a spiritual workout, church, and here's the reason, that we will have faith. Jesus said, Matthew 21, 22, whatever you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. The NLT says, if you have faith, you will receive it. If you have faith, another version adds, according to God's will. If you're asking for the things that God wants to give you, you got them. When? That's up to God, but you've got them. So here's the lesson. And to me, this is the lesson where the trumpets are sounding. Extend roots and draw water. Extend roots and draw water. This is a time for us, and we've got roots. We've got root. We have got some trees in this church that have roots. They're strong believers from years of putting down roots in Christ. We've got to, we've got to extend roots and draw water for this event, for this pandemic, but church also for the future. For the future. I talk more about that on Wednesday nights, but for right now. Put down roots and draw water. I've been clearing property that Karen and I have bought, and there are roots that are so tough, I can't pull them. If they're only half an inch thick, they are so tough, I've taken out a pocket knife and cut them. They're that strong. Holding the tree secure, drawing water. Jesus has a word for us in as we extend roots and draw water. He is going to say to us, trust me. Trust me. 
If he says there is word scattered on the path, or word that's scattered on the shallow ground, or word that's scattered into the thorny ground, or word that's scattered into the good ground, here are two words that he said to me to say to you. He says, trust me. Trust me. And now let that go into our hearts. You all have good hearts. You are good soil. I'm not there yet. Let me, let me finish. We'll go through the outline, then I'll finish up. The third p- p- place on the path is thorny ground. Thorny ground. Church, I have seen a couple of thistles growing in the yard. I want to go get me a sharp blade or a weed. I want to dig them out. They don't have a stalk. They don't have a pink flower yet. I don't want them to get anywhere near that. I want the thorns out. The th- thorny ground is a struggling heart. Jesus said, the cares of life and the deceitfulness of riches can choke us out. Do we have the cares of life life right now? Yes, we do. The cares of life, if we're not careful, can choke out our faith, can choke out God's Word. What's the lesson? What's the lesson? Find and chop out thorns. Find and chop out the thorns. Remember in, in Luke 10, Martha, Martha is our person to me who had a struggling heart. The thorns, the cares of this life were choking her out. Jesus said she was worried and troubled about many things. He told her one thing is needed. One thing is needed. What did he mean? What was the one thing that Mary got it and Martha didn't? Could it be faith? believing Jesus can take care of these things if we follow what he says and when he says? Martha is appropriate fixing a meal, but was that the time for it? Should she not have maybe been spending time with Jesus when he was teaching and then the meal? Find and chop out the thorns. They're there, church. We've got time now to look at them and do it. Some of those thorns are in our minds. They come into our minds. If Satan's not only good at snatching seed, he's good at putting in thorns. One of the things he will say to us is we will not make it. We won't make it. This is going to change the whole world. You'll never make it, and you'll never be able to pay your bills. Lies. Lies, but thorns. What if we were to speak into our minds, be assured God has the answer, He has the provision, and He's testing us and growing us and helping us. Up here is a big tool for our, our victory, our faith in what we say to ourselves and each other according to God's Word. Fourth, the good ground. The good ground is a surrendered heart. A surrendered heart, meaning, Lord, not my way, yours. Lord, I got a lot of ideas, but I surrender to what you tell me to do. Let me tell you a couple of accounts of people who did what God told them to do. One of them was one of Martin Luther's contemporaries back in the 1500s. His name was John Brents. He was a friend, and John Brents was very much for the Reformation, very much for grace alone and, and Scripture alone, very much King Charles V was after, was after John Brents also, sending men to, to capture him, take his life. And John Brents knew it. And when John Brents heard that there was a troop of Spanish cavalry coming to arrest him, John Brents went to prayer. And here's what God said. Take a loaf of bread, go to the upper part of town, there'll be an open door, Enter that door and hide yourself under the roof. John Brents did exactly what God said. He went into town, the upper part of town, there was one open door. John went in. He took a loaf of bread with him. And there he hid for 14 days, two weeks, self-quarantine, self-hidden, two weeks. God sent a hen I have to, a hen who came and laid an egg every day, didn't cackle, didn't make a sound, came, laid the egg and left, 14 days straight to feed John Brents. On the 15th day, the hen did not come. On the 15th day, the community 
shouted out, they're gone, they're gone. And they did not find John Brents because John Brents asked God what to do, God told him what to do, and God hid him. Last story, and then our invitation. In the Catholic Church, and I go back and forth, denominations, if you know Jesus, I'm not concerned about denomination. In the 70s and 80s, there was a, a fellow named Bruce who had a wife named Linda, and they lived up in Michigan, uh, up in Detroit. And they were providing days of renewal and renewal teaching classes and renewal services in the Catholic Church. I have a hunch it was the Catholic Charismatic Movement, uh, but they didn't say that in, in what I read. But nonetheless, people are experiencing God. And in that meeting, God told Bruce, of course, they, they, they would receive a, a collection. They call it a collection, the Catholic Church. In the Protestant Church, it's an offering. They take up an offering for Bruce and Linda to support them in their ministry. And he was a, an ordained Catholic deacon. Um, took up the offering and God laid on his heart, put $100 in an envelope and give it to Bob, to Bob and Sheila. Bob was the lay leader of that event and he shared that he lost his job for quite a while and struggling to make ends meet and just wanted prayer. He wasn't asking for money. But God told Bruce, put the money in an envelope, put their name on it and give it to them after the service. And back then, $100 for them was a, was a lot. $100 was a lot. But he did it. He gave them the envelope, and they were so thankful for the envelope and for being recognized their need. They took it home, put the envelope on the mantel, and they didn't need it for a while, but the day came they would need it for groceries, so they opened the envelope and took out some money for groceries. And then the day came they needed it for gas, and then they needed to pay their utility bills, and then their mortgage payment, and not just one month, four or five or six months, they kept going to the envelope and drawing out the money and paying their bills. And then the money finished up when Bob got a job, a job better than he'd had before, as prophesied by the Lord. Better income and better job. God took care of Bob. And Bob and Sheila happened to be back in Detroit, and they went to see Bruce and, and Linda, and they told Bruce, Bruce, Thank you so much for that generous, generous gift. That paid our bills and kept us going for months. Months. And Bruce's face went white. And his heart started to race because Bruce knew how much was in that envelope. There was only $100 in the envelope. There is no telling how much money that Bob and Sheila actually took out of the envelope. Mortgage and utilities in the 80s for four or five months, what, two, three, four thousand dollars? That the seed that Bruce planted was multiplied 30, 60, or 100 fold? Wow. I mean, that's today. Now, is God going to do that to us? Am I going to give out envelopes to everybody at Trinity? Church, God rarely repeats himself. That was a miracle for that moment. And what the wonderful thing is, is Jesus has secrets and surprises of provision that you will never predict. You will never predict it. So don't try. But trust him for spiritual provision, for financial provision, for enough pretty days to get the kids outside, for, for family provision, insanity provision. And he will lead us through this virus to be a stronger church and a stronger nation, a stronger community because of faith. Faith happens when we do this command, when Jesus says, trust me, and we do. Faith is developed. Here's our invitation song. You can probably already know what it is, what faith can do. What faith can do. Do you need help? Ask. Ask. Are you secure? Praise him. What faith in Jesus can do is unlimited. Karen. Everybody falls sometimes. Gotta have the strength to rise from the ashes and make a new Anyone can feel the ache You think it's 
more than you can take, but you're stronger, stronger than you know. Don't you give up now, the sun will soon be shining. You gotta face the clouds to find the silver lining. I've seen dreams that move the mountains, hope that doesn't ever end, even when the sky is falling. I've seen miracles just happen, silent prayers get answered, broken hearts become brand new. That's what faith can do. screen of the sermon at the very end. Jesus worked and worked to plant and cultivate this seed. That seed was faith. Faith. You got to work it. You got to do it. You got to exercise it. It just doesn't happen. We got to participate in it. And when we do, <laughs> you will be, you will be a preacher of faith to everybody you know. You will be a witness to Jesus Christ to everybody you know. You will tell what Jesus can do. There is no limit. There is no end. He is a God of heaven and earth with an unlimited love and unlimited resources and a very important mission to save as many people as possible for an eternity in heaven. That's why he came. He won. That's why he saved us. That's why he sends us. He won. Now, Tanya, last week you asked if we do Oh Happy Day, and we weren't ready. This week we could do it, but we're not ready yet. Not that Karen couldn't sing it. She could. But here's a vision. How about when we come back together, we sing it? Now, Tanya, Karen wants you to take the first tambourine and crumb across the front of the sanctuary with all the women, like Miriam did after the Red Sea. So if you want to take a tambourine and come across the sanctuary, I know Pam will follow you, and the women can dance and celebrate that we are back in the sanctuary and we have the victory. 
I told you, I know that's not in your comfort zone. If you want to give Mercedes the tambourine, she'll take it. She will go around the sanctuary, and we will celebrate. And I know there's a victory, but I'll be honest with you, I'm a bit sober. I'm not quite ready for a happy day. And my wife would really like to have the whole band with her to do it. So let's that be our vision. We'll come back together and we will sing, Oh Happy Day, because once again, our God will have delivered us out of trouble. So with that, I want to have a brief prayer. Close us and let God cover you with his protection. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God, what faith can do, Jesus, you taught us over and over and over, and then we finally got it with, with the help of the Holy Spirit, the disciples got it. Strengthen our faith. Help us to know you mean every word that you spoke. And that word is still good today. And may that word now take root in our heart. Jesus, you said, trust me. You're saying to us now, trust me. And help us to follow you and every good medical advice. Help us do our part. Jesus, be glorified. Be glorified. In your name we pray. Amen.